Hey everybody. Here's the chapter 8 lecture, The Mole Concept. I know it's a little late coming out, but better late than never. We're covering this chapter over the course of two weeks, so we've covered approximately half of the chapter already in the live lecture. I'm still going to cover all of that stuff in this lecture so that you have a reference for that too. So you may see some repeat problems. We did a few of the practice ones in class, but I've also got several new ones. So hopefully that'll help you if you get stuck on your homework and it'll help refresh you on what we covered on Monday slash Tuesday. So without further ado, let's get started. Before we can talk about the mole, we have to talk about Avogadro's number, which is what the mole is based on. Avogadro's number is the number of atoms in 12.01 grams of carbon. Avogadro's number is pretty big, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. It's a lot of carbon atoms. The mole is a unit of measure that we use to talk about amounts of chemical substances. And in this case, we're talking about 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Particles can mean atoms, or it can mean molecules. That's pretty much how we're gonna be using it. So particles is kind of a catch-all word to mean both of those things. So one mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms or molecules. If you have one mole of sodium, let's say, sodium atoms, that means that you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd sodium atoms. If you have a molecule like CO2, carbon dioxide, then you're gonna have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd carbon dioxide molecules. So a mole is just like kind of saying, I have a dozen eggs. We know a dozen means 12. Here, one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23. We can use that number to do some calculations. Throughout this, um, throughout this video, I'm gonna give you some problem types. And in live lecture, we had kind of a cheat sheet at the end that had all of the different conversion factors or unit factors that you need to solve these types of problems. So between this lecture and the live lecture, you should be set. The first problem type that we're gonna cover is converting from the number of moles to the number of atoms. And it's the same thing if we were converting to the number of molecules. Our question says, how many sodium atoms are in 0 0.240 moles of sodium? The given information is in moles. The question is asking how many sodium atoms. So that's how we know what type of question we're answering. Okay. Identifying the problem type is the first step in solving the problem. If you don't know what information you have, then you can't figure out how to use it. When you're going from the number of moles to the number of atoms, you're always going to use Avogadro's number. The unit equation, yes, I said unit equation, bringing back the memories of chapter two, is one mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. From this unit equation, we can write two different unit factors. Remember that the unit factors look like fractions. So we can write one mole over 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms 
and we can flip it over and write the reciprocal. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms over one mole. Now we've got a decision to make. Which one of these unit factors is going to actually get us from moles to atoms? Well, we need to choose one that's going to cancel out the moles. And to cancel the moles, we need moles on the bottom. So that means that we're going to have Avogadro's number in the top. And moles in the bottom. When you do this math, you're going to multiply across. And then you divide by one, but you know, you don't have to put that part into your calculator. You should get something in the ballpark of 1.44 times 10 to the 23rd sodium atoms. So you'll need to brush up on scientific notation using your calculator and putting in exponents and also, don't forget units. If you just give me a number, that's not good enough. You're going to lose some points. So tell me what that number means. In this case, we've got sodium atoms. So that's our first problem type, moles to atoms. We can also do the reverse. We can take some number of atoms and convert it to moles. How many moles of tin are in 1.25 times 10 to the 21 atoms of tin? Our given information, we're given atoms. The question asks how many moles? So we're trying to figure out moles. And MOL is the abbreviation for mole and moles, just FYI. We're still going to use Avogadro's number, but we're just going to use a different unit factor. We'll start by writing down what we have, and that's a large number of atoms of tin. This time we're trying to get to moles, so we want to cancel out atoms. We're going to put Avogadro's number on the bottom and moles on the top. The atoms cancel and you're left with moles of tin. So your calculator is going to tell you something like that. But let's say we wanted to express it in scientific notation. We need to write a coefficient that is between, that's at least one and less than 10. So that means that we're gonna take that decimal point and put it right behind the two. That's our coefficient. This number is much smaller than one. So our exponent's going to be negative and then we look at how many decimal places we moved. One, two, three. And don't forget your units. Again, if you don't remember scientific notation, please refresh yourself. Before we can talk about the next problem type, we have to talk about another concept, and that's molar mass. If you look at the periodic table, you can see, this is my little piece of the periodic table here, you've got the atomic number at the top, you've got your element symbol, and then below that symbol, is the atomic mass, and that's in atomic mass units. 
Well, that's great for one atom. But what about a whole mole? If you express the atomic mass of a substance in grams, then you have the molar mass of that substance. So I wrote out carbon. The atomic mass is 12.01 AMU. If we wanted the molar mass of carbon, it's 12.01 grams per mole. We can extend that to other substances. So let's say we had something more complicated like nitrogen gas, which remember nitrogen gas is one of those diatomic molecules. So you'll see N2, it's a pair. If I wanted the molar mass of nitrogen gas, I would look at the periodic table. And the one that I gave you guys um, that we use on exams would say 14.007. Let's express that in grams per mole. Now we need to look at how many nitrogens we have. We have two nitrogens because of this subscript. You do the multiplication and you get your molar mass. So you can sum up the atomic masses of all of the elements in a compound to get the molar mass. Let's do another example. Let's find the molar mass of copper two nitrite. And if you want, you can pause, try this one, and then look at the answer. We need to look at several things. We've got copper, and then we've got, see this two on the outside of the parentheses? That means that we have two nitrite molecules. So what we have to do is take the atomic mass of copper and add that to two times the mass of the nitrite molecule. So that's kind of what I set up here. Let's put some numbers to it. If you look up copper, that's what you'll find. Nitrogen we just did. Then oxygen on the one that I gave you is 15.999. If you use 16, I ain't gonna be mad at you. So that's the copper. This is the NO2. When you add all that up, you should get something in the ballpark of 155 0.556 grams per mole. That's the concept of molar mass. We can use molar mass to convert moles to grams. This is our second problem type. What is the mass of 1.33 moles of titanium? Our given information is moles of titanium, so that's what we're starting with. The question is, what is the mass? Again, identifying the problem type. If you can't identify the problem type, it's gonna be harder to solve. So you look at what the given information is, and then what is it that they're asking? That's how you figure out the problem type. Whenever you're going from moles to mass, you use molar mass, which I abbreviate MM. The molar mass of titanium, 
you just have to look at the periodic table. If you look at the periodic table, you'll find 47.867, and then we add in the grams per mole. We can write this molar mass, you guessed it, as two unit factors. So there's one, and then you flip it to get the other. That's the reciprocal. And again, we have to ask ourselves, which one should we use? We have moles. We're trying to get to grams. That means we've got to cancel out the moles. So moles need to be on the bottom. Moles on the bottom, grams on top. Our moles cancel and we're left with grams. When you do the multiplication, and you take into account sig figs, you should get 63.7 grams of titanium. Again, units, tell me grams of titanium. Grams is even the more important part than the titanium. If you just leave me with 63.7, I don't know what that is. So please write units. Let's recap a little bit. We have Avogadro's number. And that tells us how many particles are in one mole, whether that's atoms or molecules. We also know the molar mass, which tells us the grams of a substance in one mole. With this information, that means that we can use unit factors to calculate the number of grams in a certain number of atoms. Let's give that one a shot. What is the mass of 2.55 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of lead? To identify the problem type, you look at your given information. We're given atoms. The question is asking what is the mass? We don't see anything about moles here. So that means we have to use moles as an intermediary. We can go from atoms to moles and moles to mass. Just like in chapter two, when we were doing our conversions, we had to convert to a base unit and then convert to another unit. Moles is the same thing. And if we break it up, these should be two problem types that we recognize. So all of the smaller problem types that we're, what that we're doing you can string them together to do longer, more complicated calculations, but they're really not that much harder. You just have to identify which ones you need to group together. When you're going from atoms to moles, you always use Avogadro's number. When you're going from moles to mass, you always need molar mass. And in this case, we're dealing with lead. You look at the periodic table, and it'll tell you 207.2. You report that as grams per mole. 
Now let's start putting together our equation. We're going to start with the given information. And we need to write our first unit factor. We're getting rid of atoms. So that means Avogadro's number has to go in the bottom. Don't forget to put that one mole on top. And as you can see, I'm trying to color code here so you can track which part of the equation accounts for which part of our plan. The next unit factor is going to take us from moles to mass. I need to cancel the moles, so I have to put the moles on the bottom. That leaves the grams of lead to go on top. Always go through and do your unit analysis to make sure that you're canceling out and ending up with the units that you want at the end. We got rid of our atoms. We got rid of our moles. And now we're left with grams of lead. Remember that to cancel, you have to have the units on the top and on the bottom. When you work through this math and you take sig figs into account, you get 87.8 grams of lead. We can always flip it and reverse it, y'all. So this is an example of going from mass to the number of molecules. How many fluorine molecules are present in 2.25 grams of fluorine gas? Our given information is a mass. And our question is asking how many molecules so that's what we're trying to convert to. We don't see anything about moles here. So we have to convert mass to moles and then moles to molecules. Once we do that, this problem looks a little bit more recognizable. To go from mass to moles, we're still going to use molar mass. The molar mass of fluorine, you're just going to take two times the atomic mass of the fluorine atom. So I didn't write that out here. I'm just writing out what the molar mass is. The second part of our equation, we'll take those moles and convert to molecules. Always and forever, Avogadro's number. I'm going to try to keep the colors the same, but I might slip up, y'all, because my memory sometimes. So I believe we did the mass to moles and moles to mass in purple. So we're going to try to keep it purple the whole time. Our mass is 2.25 grams of fluorine gas. Now we have to write a unit factor. This time we want to cancel out the grams. We have to put grams in the bottom. That way they'll cancel. On top, we put moles. To go from moles to molecules, we need Avogadro's number. We're canceling the moles, so that goes on the bottom. We want molecules at the end. So Avogadro's number goes on top. Let's do our unit analysis. 
we've got grams on the top and grams on the bottom, so that cancels. Moles on the top, moles on the bottom, that cancels. We're left with molecules. That checks out. When you do the math, don't forget 2.25, you're dividing by 37.996. So you divide, then you multiply by Avogadro's number. So always be careful about that. You're not just always multiplying through. You're multiplying and dividing. When you do that math, this is what you should end up with. I encourage you to try it in your calculator. One, because sometimes I make mistakes. Let's just be real. We all fumble with the calculator. But two, make sure that you can put it into your calculator and get the right answer. Because sometimes it's a matter of relearning how to use that calculator. So if you get an answer that's different from mine, let me know. It could be that I typed something in wrong, or maybe you need a little help with your calculator. Either way, we can straighten it out. Let's do one more. You're absolutely going to have this type of a problem on the exam. Hands down, guarantee it. It looks like a problem that you may not be able to solve, but it's not. What is the mass of a single molecule of sulfur dioxide? And then I'm kind enough to give you the molar mass. 64.07 grams per mole. What we're given is a single molecule. That's a number, single is one, right? So we're starting with the number of molecules. And the question is asking, what is the mass? This is a molecules to mass question, except we just have one molecule. We're going to take that molecule and convert it into moles using Avogadro's number. Then we're going to take those moles and convert it to mass using the molar mass of sulfur dioxide, which was already given. So we don't even have to do anything fancy. Now we've got to set up the problem. We literally have one molecule of SO2. To get to moles, we've got to put moles on top and molecules in the bottom. Then we've got to use the molar mass to get from moles to grams. We put the moles in the bottom so they cancel. And the grams go in the top. Unit analysis, we get rid of molecules. We get rid of moles. We're left with grams. Punch that into your calculator, you're gonna get you're gonna get a really small number. And you might feel like, oh man, that can't possibly be right. But it is. Think about it. One molecule, that's really, really tiny. So it's gonna have a really, really, really small number of grams associated with it. So trust yourself, okay? Now here, I use the molar mass to determine how many significant figures because that's the only given thing that I have. So I gave you four sig figs there. I will either tell you how many sig figs or I'll give you the molar mass and you use that to determine sig figs for this type of a problem. 
but I promise I won't make it tricky. Before we can do our last problem type, we've got to cover one more concept. This concept is specific to gases. Gases have volume, right? And if you have a gas, one mole of it, at standard temperature and pressure, which is zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, the volume of that gas, no matter what its identity, is going to be 22.4 liters. So you could have one mole of oxygen gas, one mole of nitrogen gas, one mole of hydrogen gas. If they're all at the same standard temperature and pressure, they will all have a volume of 22.4 liters. That 22.4 liters is called the molar volume. So we can use that as a definition for the mole, but only for gases. One mole of gas is equal to 22.4 liters of gas. And we can relate that again to the number of molecules of gas using Avogadro's number. This means that we can use volume to determine the number of moles and the number of molecules. A sample of methane, which is CH4, occupies 4.50 liters at STP. How many moles of methane are present? Our given information is a volume, 4.50 liters. That's where we're starting. The question asks, how many moles? That's where we want to end up. This is a volume to mole question. And it's specific for gases. For this, we use the molar volume, which I abbreviate MV. The other thing that clues you in that you're working with a gas is that it says at STP. So if you see that, know that you're working with a gas. We can write a unit equation that describes the relationship between the mole and volume. From here, we can write two unit factors. And of course, we can flip that over. And the question becomes, which one do we use? We're starting with liters. We want to end up with moles. We got to cancel out the liters so they have to go on the bottom. On top, you're going to put your one mole of methane. Leaders cancel, we're left with moles. Remember that you're dividing here, 4.5 divided by 22.4. When you put that into your calculator, you should get 0 0.201 moles of methane. Again, remember sig figs. And we're using the given information here, which has three sig figs. The molar volume is an exact number, so we don't include that.
we're going to take a little bit of a detour. We've been talking about moles, but now we're going to detour into density. We talked about density in chapter two, but we were really talking about solids and liquids. We didn't cover gases like that. The density of a gas is much, much less than a liquid. We did talk about that in chapter three. For a gas that's at STP, you can define density in a special way. Normally when we think of density, we think of simply mass over volume, which is absolutely true for, for any substance. But for the density of a gas that's at STP, what's also true is if you take the molar mass of that gas in grams and divide it by the molar volume, which is 22.4 liters, you can also calculate the density that way. Again, this is a special case for gases at STP only. Let's try it out. What is the density of methane gas at STP? Could be pretty intimidating because we don't see any numbers here. But we do know the chemical formula for methane gas, CH4. And because this gas is at STP, we can find the molar mass and divide by the molar volume, which we already know as well. To find the molar mass of methane, you're going to add together the carbon plus four times the atomic mass of hydrogen. When you do that, you should get something like this. The molar volume is always 22.4 liters. So we're going to write in our density equation. You just write the grams. You don't say grams per mole for this. So 16.042 grams divided by the molar volume. There's your density. Don't forget your units. For gases, you're typically looking at grams per liter for density. Again, gases are much less dense than liquids and solids. We can also use both of the definitions of density to solve for molar mass you will absolutely have a question like this on your exam. So pay attention. An unknown gas has a mass of 4.29 grams and occupies 1.50 liters at STP. What is the molar mass? That sounds like, what? You're giving me grams and liters and you're asking me about molar mass? But remember, if we have a gas at STP, we can define density two ways. Mass over volume and molar mass over molar volume. In the problem, we're given a mass and a volume and we're told that the gas is at STP. So if we take these two equations and set them equal to each other, we can fill in what we know and solve for what we don't, which is the molar mass. If you multiply both sides by the molar volume,
then you get an equation to solve for the molar mass. Our molar volume is 22.4 liters. The mass and volume we were given in the problem. 4.29 grams, 1.50 liters. The liters cancel out to leave you with grams. When you do the math, you should get 64.1 grams. And since it's a molar mass, we'll call it grams per mole. So it's not that bad. You just have to remember the two ways that you can define density. Mass divided by volume and molar mass divided by molar volume for a gas at STP. Now we've got three different ways to talk about a mole. We've got Avogadro's number, molar mass, and molar volume. This means we can do even more math. Hooray, right? Let's try some more problems. What is the mass of 3.36 liters of ozone gas at STP? Always identify the problem type. We're starting with a volume of a gas. The question is, what is the mass? That's what we're looking for. We see volume, we see mass. We don't see anything about moles. So we have to use moles to get from one to the other. When you break it up this way, you should recognize the two problem types. Volume to moles and moles to mass. We've done both of these. To go from a volume of a gas to moles at STP, you use molar volume, where one mole is equal to 22.4 liters. To go from moles to mass, you use the molar mass of whatever substance. We've got ozone gas, which is O3. You just multiply the atomic mass of oxygen by 3. If you use 16, then you'll have 48 here. But I'm trying to do right, y'all, and not round. But again, if you use 48 here, you're going to get the right answer. Now let's start setting up. We need a new color for volume to moles. So we'll add some red to the mix. Starting with our given volume of 3.36 liters of ozone gas, we need to write a unit factor that will cancel out the liters and leave us with moles of ozone. The molar volume goes on the bottom, and one mole of ozone goes in the top. I think moles to mass was purple. Here's where my memory might fail me. I can remember all these equations and molar volume and stuff like that, but I can't remember what color I made an equation at the beginning of this video. Priorities, I know. So hopefully it was purple. We need to write a unit factor from our molar mass. We want to end up with grams, so we'll put those grams in the top. We'll put one mole of ozone in the bottom, and that will cancel it out. Let's double check with our units. We got rid of liters. We got rid of moles. 
and we're left with grams. So that's a good start. You're going to divide 3.36 by 22.4, then multiply by the number of grams in one mole. You should get 7.20 grams of ozone. Again, in the live lecture, I went over a cheat sheet where we talked about all the different problem types and then what information you can use and what the unit factor looks like. So if you didn't tune in for that, if you weren't there in class, but you're watching the video, make sure that you either look at the notes for the, you know, the PDF for the live lecture, or you find that part in the video. We only went over, you know, kind of pretty much we're almost at the point of what we covered this week in class. So make sure you get that into your notes. You can't use it for the exam, but it's great for doing your homework and kind of helping you get acclimated to identifying the problem types. Let's do another problem. How many molecules of argon gas occupy 0 0.430 liters at STP? Again, we're starting with the volume. That's our given information. The question asks, how many molecules? So we know we're going from volume to molecules, but we can't just go straight there. We've got to use moles. The first problem type you should recognize, volume to moles. We use molar volume there. The second problem type, moles to molecules. We use Avogadro's number. Let's start setting it up. We've got our volume of argon. Then we write a unit factor with the molar volume. We need to cancel out those liters so they go on the bottom. One mole of argon goes at the top. We're trying to get to molecules. So molecules will go on top. And that one mole of argon goes in the bottom. The liters cancel. The moles cancel. We've got molecules left. So that checks out. Do the math and take into account sig figs. You get 1.16 times 10 to the 22nd molecules of argon. Do take the time to check your units. If you're not writing down the units when you write down how you're solving the equation, you're not gonna recognize your mistakes. You also won't get full credit when you hand in your chapter eight check-in. So make sure that you write it out because if you get it wrong, you put something in your calculator wrong, whatever. If you put this part correct, you'll get most of the points because that's where the bulk of the work is. Anyone can just keep punching numbers in until they reach a conclusion that they think might be right. But if you show me that you set it up properly, then I understand that you understand how the problem works. So please show your work. So that was the last of what we covered this past week. I don't know when you're watching this video, but 
That was covered in the first part of the chapter eight lecture series, the live lecture series. Now we're moving on to things that we did not cover yet. Starting with percent composition. Percent composition just has the list of the mass percent of each element. I'll give you an example. We've got this lovely cup of water here. I wouldn't mind some water. Doing these videos, you get thirsty. If I wanted to do, if I wanted to complete the percent composition for water, I would have to look at all of the elements in water. So there's hydrogen and there's oxygen. I'd also need to figure out the molar mass of water. You take the atomic mass of hydrogen and multiply it by two, and you add the atomic mass of oxygen. If you're using the periodic table that I gave you, you should get 18.015 grams per mole. So it's about 18. To get the percent composition, we're going to look at the number of grams in each mole that comes from each element. For hydrogen, we've got two moles of hydrogen and then we've got its number of grams there for each mole. And if you divide that by the molar mass of water and multiply by 100%, you will get the percent of the mass of water, that's hydrogen. It's 11.2%. So that tells you that water is 11.2% hydrogen. We would do the same thing for oxygen. There's only one of them. And you should get 88.8%. Regardless of how many elements there are in your compound, the total should always be 100%. With rounding, it may be 100.02 or something like that. That's fine. But it shouldn't be 130%. That's wrong. So again, the percent composition, we're looking at the contribution of each element to the overall molar mass of the compound. Here's another example. You can pause it and take a shot at it. We're looking at TNT, it's an explosive, and its composition is listed here. For the molar mass of TNT, I'll write this one out because it is a little bit more complex. We've got to take care of that carbon first. Then we've got the hydrogens, we've got five of those. And now we've got three of these NO2s. So that's the C7, H5, NO2, 2. You add all that stuff together, and you should get something like that, about 227 grams per mole. Now we need to take into account each element and how it contributes to the overall mass. For the percent carbon, you're 
you're going to take the part from carbon and literally put it right there over top of the molar mass. Multiply by 100%. Do the same thing for all of the others. Your hydrogen is pretty small, pretty small percentage. I wish I had some music in the background, y'all. There's your nitrogen. And finally, we're getting to the oxygen. That's the percent composition for TNT, the whole thing. You have to do it for every single element. When you add those up, you should get, again, 100%. It may be 100.02 or something like that, but it should equal 100%, not 110, not 105, 100%. The next concept that we're going to cover is empirical formulas and eventually molecular formulas. So we've been doing a lot with the mole. We've been looking at percent composition. Now we're looking more at the compound itself. So we started with the percent composition. Now we're going to talk about empirical formulas. The empirical formula of a compound is the simplest whole number ratio of ions in a formula unit or atoms in a molecule. So let's say that you had benzene, which is C6H6, okay? Looks like that. It's got some double bonds in there, okay? That's benzene. The empirical formula, the simplest whole number ratio, is CH. If you have six of carbon and six of hydrogen, the simplest that you can reduce it down to is divide them both by six, and that gives you CH. Remember, there's an implied one there. If you have octane, that's C8H18. You've got to find the lowest common denominator there. You can uh, take both of these, divide by 2. That gives you 4 and 9, so C4H9. Compounds can have the same empirical formula, but different molecular formulas, and I'll show you what that means. Let's first calculate and determine an empirical formula. You've got a sample of radium metal, and you heat it to produce radium oxide. What is the empirical formula? Looks like you're up the creek without a paddle, but you're not. We've got masses, and we know that what we made was radium oxide. This oxide means that we've added oxygen. If we take the difference between our starting material and our product, then we can figure out how much oxygen was added.
So we know our compound has 1.640 grams of radium and 0 0.115 grams of oxygen. We can figure out how many moles of each of those we have. And from there, figure out the ratio of radium to oxygen. Radium is Ra. And you're going to use the molar mass. Remember, this is just going from grams to moles, or mass to moles. You look it up on your periodic table. It's pretty big. So that's how many moles of radium are in this compound. Now let's do the same thing for the oxygen. Because what we're looking for here is the ratio of radium to oxygen. They look pretty close. So we call this the N when you divide the number of moles when you do that division you get about one it's like 1.0 something but it's one what that means is for our chemical formula or our empirical formula, we have one radium and one oxygen. So we're looking at the moles of radium and the moles of oxygen, and we're comparing the two. They seem to be about equal, so that means that one mole of radium is mixed with one mole of oxygen. That's the empirical formula. And don't worry, we'll do practice, because empirical formulas and molecular formulas seem to be a little bit difficult. So we'll do practice on this in class. You can also get empirical formulas for mass composition. You just have to make one assumption. So if we've got acetylene, it's 92.2% carbon and 7.83% hydrogen. What is the empirical formula? We've got to do one key thing. Assume that we have 100 grams of the substance. That way, instead of saying 92.2%, we can say 92.2 grams of carbon. Because if we have 100 grams, and we know that 92.2% of it is carbon, that's 92.2 grams of carbon. From there, we're going to do the same mass to mole trick. We do the same thing for the hydrogen. So 
since they're so close, we know that our n is equal to 1. What that translates to is 1 carbon for every 1 hydrogen. What if, and this is just for your own benefit, what if our numbers were a little different? What if we had these numbers? you would take the smallest number, put it on the bottom, the bigger number, put it on top, and that would give you two. So that means that for every one carbon, there's two hydrogens. Nope, said that wrong because my brain didn't work right. I flipped it over in my head. Two is two over one. So there's two carbons for every one hydrogen, which in our real world doesn't make sense. But I wanted to give you an example of what if it's not equal because they're not always going to be equal. Then that N is a ratio. So it tells you the number of carbons to hydrogens or oxygen to hydrogen or whatever it is that you have. It's a ratio. I think I have an example somewhere where it's not just one, one, and one. And if not, we'll do some in class. So that was the empirical formula. Now I've got to talk about the molecular formula. The molecular formula is a multiple of the empirical formula. If we had our acetylene example, and we say that it has a molar mass of 26 grams per mole. We need to first find the molar mass of our empirical formula, which is CH. If you add those two together, it's 12.01 plus 1.008. So that's the molar mass of our empirical formula. If you take the molar mass of the molecular formula, and divide it by the molar mass of the empirical formula, then you will get your N which is how many times you're going to multiply your empirical formula by. So if we take that 26 divided by what we got was pretty much 13, that's 2. If our empirical formula is CH, then we're going to multiply that by 2. And that's the molecular formula. Let's do a sample problem. This time we're gonna go from percent composition to molecular formula. So we're gonna do all the things and combine all three of these topics that we just did. So we have an insecticide that causes dizziness in humans. We've got the percent composition. It's got some carbon, some hydrogen, and some chlorine. We also know the molar mass, 290 grams per mole. We have to find the molecular formula. Assume that we have 100 grams of this insecticide. 
That way we can take those percentages and make the masses and figure out the number of moles. There's our number of moles of carbon. I'm going to take that 2.1% for hydrogen. Call it grams because we've got 100 grams. There's our moles of hydrogen. And there's our moles of chlorine. You'll notice that they're all about the same, about two moles. So the empirical formula is CHCl. But we're not done. We need to find the molecular formula. That means we've got to figure out the molar mass of our empirical formula, CHCl. And you just add up the atomic masses of each of those and you should get this. We're already told the molar mass of the molecular formula. That's in the problem. We just have to divide one by the other. Put the molecular one on top. The empirical one on the bottom. And what you get is about six. You get like 5.98. That's six. Now if you got like 5.98 four or 5.5 5, that'd be different but here we got something that's pretty much six that means you're going to take your empirical formula and multiply it by six that's our molecular formula We'll do practice on this in class. And for the second part of chapter eight, it's literally gonna be percent composition, empirical formulas, and molecular formulas. And then after we cover that, we'll do some review of the mole calculations we were doing. Here are your reminders. Midterm grades are gonna be submitted this week. So make sure that you are up to date you have a chapter check-in that is due on Sunday, the 18th, by 11.59 p.m. on Blackboard, and that's different from the syllabus. I'm breaking up the chapter check-in and the Mastering Chemistry. So make sure that you submit your PDF by October 18th at 11.59 p.m. if you want full credit. And show your work. Please show your work. If you don't show your work, even if you write down the correct answer, you only get half credit. I need to see how you got it. And if you just put an answer and it's wrong, you don't get partial credit. Anyway, Chapter 8, Mastering Chemistry, is due on October 25th. So work on the Mastering Chemistry that you can now, get some of it out of the way, then finish it up next week after we have a lecture. And finally, your exam four is coming up at the end of October, and it's going to cover chapters seven and eight. 
So once we finish chapter eight, you're going to have an exam. So I'll make sure there's plenty of review when we finish going over chapter eight. That exam will become available on October 28th, which is a Wednesday, and it will close and disappear at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. So make sure you take it in the allotted time. That's all I have for you. I hope you're able to watch this before we have class next week. Me saying this in the video doesn't help, doesn't make you watch it, but it is my sincere desire. It'll make things go much smoother and then we'll have more time for review for the exam. Until then, stay safe and I'll see you soon.